Yay. Okay, folks. <coughs> oh, yes. We are uh, going to get started now with module three. Um, Before lunch, we learned about alignment algorithms. The second part of that, in order for it to be really useful, is we want to learn how do we call variants. So the way I've broken down this talk is basically into five different sections. Just what are we trying to accomplish when we're doing variant calling? Uh, the second uh, process, well, we'll look at what goes into a variant calling pipeline. What kind of components would you usually see when you're trying to do variant calling? Uh, just like we had the BAM format before, there's a standardized file format with variants called the BCF file format. And then to make to get the most power out of your variant calling, uh, a lot of people have individual variant calling filters to filter the variant calls that have been produced. Um, this helps reduce a lot of false positives that you might see in your data. And then I'll talk briefly about dynamic filtering. So variant calling is really all about trying to find in the sample genome, you're trying to find those locations that are different from your reference genome. So you might be looking for heterozygous SNPs on the left, or on the right, you might be looking for homozygous deletions. You might be looking for more advanced things like structural variants. And that's something that Aaron's going to discuss later on today. Now, what complicates this process is you know, ideally, you know, if, if this talk represented the reference on all these um, reads down here uh, where individual sequencing reads, what you're trying to look for is some sort of a pattern. So here you see suddenly a location that might be a heterozygous SNP with, with A's instead of a G up here. We also see a lot of other places where you might have spurious um, differences from the genome. So what you're trying to do, the, the complexity of this process is actually to ignore those sequencing errors and concentrate on what might be a true biological variation. One of the ways we can look at it, and one of the, the earliest ways of trying to do SNP detection, sorry. Do you want to unlock the doors and I said no? Because we have lots of Yeah, yeah. One of the earliest ways that you could tackle variant calling was simply by looking at the base qualities. So again, if the top first presents uh, a reference sequence, you might have a situation where the read has a, a T with a very high quality here, and this reference location also has a very high quality. And because it's a very high quality discrepancy, you want to be more likely to believe that this is potentially a SNP or, a, or more accurately as a SNP, a single nucleotide variant. In this version, however, you have very low base qualities. And so because of that, you're neither sure of what the actual reference bases should be in this case or what the actual read base should be in this case. So you're less likely to call this position a SNP simply because you're not as certain of, of what the actual call is. And so, the way you can increase this sensitivity is you start looking at not just one read, but you look at entire stacks of reads. And so that's why traditionally with Illumina technology, people will say you need probably 30x of coverage um, to do a whole genome sequencing um, assay that does variant calling. Some other technologies you require less coverage, um, but that's pretty much the way it is. A lot of the variant callers use a Bayesian um, uh, scaffold for doing the variant calling. It's just that Bayesian statistics basically rely more on prior probabilities and observations rather than consensus uh, style statistics. You don't have to memorize this one, I promise you, but it's interesting to note that basically what goes into these calculations is you know, what, what is the number of individuals in your population? Um, you also include information about what were the actual base qualities of those alleles that you observed in that column, as well as the actual allele column that read. And then this is all normalized down here. So who knows what the, the actual classical definition of the SNP is? 
the, the classical definition is that you are observing some sort of a new allele in at least 1% of the population. And they always leave population as something very nebulous and undefined. And a lot of the times, when, when I was talking about a SNP versus a SNP, a lot of the times, even when we're doing looking for variants in a single individual, where we will erroneously call it a SNP. It's only truly a SNP if you're looking at a population of samples and you find a certain allele that occurs there. So, but you might see in literature that talks about tumor normal assays, you'll see them talk about SNVs because you're really only looking at that one sample. When you're doing variant calling, besides having lots of reads to give you additional power, also having additional sequence uh, samples uh, gives you a lot of extra power. So this is from the uh, Thousand Genomes Consortium uh, pilot paper. And what they were showing here is here we have some, some different um, data sets. And on the y-axis, basically showing how many variants in a single individual were not discovered. And so as you can see, when you only have small numbers of samples, that can be quite high, as high as 20%. But then as you add more and more samples to your, your population, the chances of you not discovering one of those variants in a single individual decreases quite substantially. And it levels off pretty quickly. Questions so far? All right. So what goes into a very calling pipeline? So this, this is taken from a, a Nielsen paper in 2011. So the processes that we've already talked about, the top is image analysis and base calling. First we need the reads to, to do something, and then we need to map those reads to a genome. That's pretty much what we did in the previous module. And then here's that extra step that we've also done. We've realigned. We've removed duplicates, and one of the steps that we haven't done, but a lot of people do, is recalibrate those base quality tools that we discussed earlier. But then it basically falls into two different types of pipelines, if you have a single sample, or if you have a population of samples. Um, and so this becomes a sort of an iterative type approach, and you do the, the the, the sample calling will identify a series of candidate SNPs, and then you might do some additional filtering here at the end, or you might tweak those filters and then go back. Uh, I think the next slide. Uh, yeah. Just a quick question on base quality and calibration. Right. So it sounds like somebody did a study and found that the bases are being, the quality is being systematically overestimated. It seems or, like a good opportunity to. No, yeah. you're exactly right. And actually, it's it's of our opinion that so when those studies were originally done by the Broad, um, they were looking at a lot of lumen events, for example, and they did find a systematic uh, bias there where we were overconfident on the higher end. Um, but nowadays, we actually when we do our internal tests, we find that base quality. Uh, calibration doesn't help at all. Uh, so, at least at Illumina, we skip that step altogether. We still do duplicate uh, removal, we still do email realignment, but the base quality recalibration, we see that as an optional step. Um, however, if you check like the GATK best practices um, webpage, you'll still see that listed there. So, it's, it's really up to your discretion. Other technologies, it really depends on what is the base caller. Um, so if you're using you know, a 4 by 4 base caller, it might have other biases. Um, so it, I, I feel like probably the best route forward is if you're ever in doubt, it couldn't hurt just to check and see what those graphs actually look like on a data set that you care about. Let's see if there is a systematic bias. And if you see those biases, then go right ahead and use that uh, calibrate. But if not, maybe that's some stuff that you can read out to speed up your analysis. But that's exactly what happened. We basically saw that bias. We went back to the base caller and said, oh, how can we improve this? So this last step looks a little bit strange. And this is one of those, one of those topics that I had the most problem with when I started 
you know, coming into the world of a variant calling, and that is, why do I have to spend so much time filtering my snips? Why can't you guys just get it right the first time though? But it's just one of those sad truths. It's, it's uh, you know, all the variant callers have their own issues, and, and when you look at the data, you have to sort of weed out, you know, the likely false positives from the, from the true positives. So if we were to look at the, the pipeline from a file-centric view, um, if you have a full human genome, you might have about 200 gigs worth of BAM files that basically have recalibrated base qualities and the duplicates removed. And then from there, you want to produce sort of a, a raw VCF file. The VCF file is the one that contains all the SNPs. We'll talk about that one uh, in a moment. So what can I actually use to do my variant calling? Well, SandTools has a built-in variant caller. Uh, GETK has one. That's the one we'll be using today. Uh, Freebase uh, was created in, in uh, uh, both uh, Aaron and my own lab, uh, at Gabor Mars lab. And then Cortex uh, bar is, is another variant caller that can gain some traction. And as you can see here, that process could take you know, anywhere up to 10 hours, depending on, on how you process that. But then here comes that next critical step. Step, those raw variants aren't good enough. And so, you know, at the road they said, you know, it might take days for an expert to go over the data set and figure out, okay, which ones are good. You could use things like the GATK variant filters, um, and those only take about 30 minutes to process. And that's what we'll be doing today. Uh, I'm sure you guys are happy that you won't have to spend days looking at all the variants. And at the end of the day, you end up with about one gigabyte of filtered variants if you were doing a whole genome um, sequencing approach. You expect between three to four million SNPs in a, in a human individual after you've done all that filtering. Yeah? If you don't want to slide back, um, when you talk about multi sample calling and single sample calling, do you mean multiple individuals? Like yes. Yes. Yeah. And you do that across all the individuals. Uh, yeah, so some, some variant callers pr produce, uh, can actually call variants at the same time. Uh, so for example, GATK, uh, when you run the command line, you can actually specify multiple down flaps all at the same time. Uh, and then it'll do those variant calls, and it actually gets additional statistical power to call the variant. So you often see better results if you're trying to do SNP calling in a population to specify all those down files at once. Um, the alternative is almost what you mentioned in your question, and that is basically doing the single uh, sample calling uh, uh, approach and then basically figuring out the, the appropriate filters for, for each of those. That, that can shift the conversion. So the making these statistical assumptions about the the the, 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 the patient or just treat them uh, independently? Uh, no, I think it made some statistical assumptions, um, and that's probably why we get the additional power. So, so for example, you know, if you were sequencing a population of 100 individuals, and in 75 per percent of those individuals, you saw that there was this one deletion there, the main color might look extra hard on those remaining 25 to see if was there any evidence of that occurring there. Whereas if you only did the variant calling on those individual ones, maybe there wouldn't be enough evidence for it to call that solution. So that's just prefer if you have enough data, it's preferred to do it this way. Right. And and if you can if you can basically um, if you can rationalize that it makes sense to call them together. Like certainly uh, certainly if you had samples from from perhaps different populations, it might be more questionable if you should do the, the very calling together. And so you make the judgment on how many additional multiple samples you're going to run. Let's say you just want to analyze one single sample. Right. So you have access to thousands of others. You just pull out randomly X number to call with your one sample. Or you no, it, it would be more like, so for example, for 1,000 genomes, um, they have three main populations in the pilot project. You, you have the, the Chinese slash Japanese population, you had an African population, and then you had a European population. 
So it would make sense to take like the European population and call those together, the African ones. Sure, that's 300 bound files. So yeah. surely you don't want to, that's, that's a lot no, of data. No. I mean, if you're, right, right, you're but doing that's... practically downloading 300 bound files to call one bound file, it's going to be very time consuming. It could take you weeks. No? But, but it's it's often worth it. The results do get better. And so at least at least when the Broad Institute um, did their analyses, 4,000 genomes, they would literally use all those samples all at once. Um, so yeah, it is a lot of data. And, and the big data problem is a huge concern with next-gen sequencing and particularly the data analysis. That's why it's, it's still... Uh, cumbersome while you have the BAM files, but it gets a little bit nicer once you have the VCF files. So it's almost like a sieve. At each step, you're, you're getting rid of some data and you're keeping the stuff that you really want, the derivative data. So we talked about the BAM file format, and now there's the VCF file format, and those also created around the time of thousands of genomes, just because there was no single uh, file format that took care of this. And now, let's see if I can use a laser pointer without getting zapped. Um, so basically, you also have a number of patent limited col columns. Uh, the first column is, is basically the reference. And then you have the physician. Um, third column is the ID. So that's usually an RSID. You see those typically on the UVSNP website. The next one is a reference allele. So G is, if you look at this position on chromosome 20, you'll see a G. And actually, what the alternative allele is A in this case. Now, that's not enough to tell you exactly what's happening uh, for this particular sample. So, if we skip ahead, if we skip ahead of, uh, past this, you see these weird fields here. One starts with 0, uh, bar 0, 1, bar 0, 1, slash 1. What that actually means is, for this sample, whatever the first sample was, zero means reference, one means the first alternate allele. So for this first person, he's homozygous for the, for the reference allele. The second person is heterozygous for the alternate allele. And the third person is homozygous for the alternate allele. Does that make sense? Question? Is there a typo or does it slightly different in the class? Ah, good observation. It's not a typo. So usually what you'll see in these uh, VCF files is this slash. Uh, the vertical bar means that that variant has been phased. So you actually know in which haplotype um, you know, the, the uh, respective alleles occur on. So that would actually make a difference if you have a pipe. It would actually make a difference if you have one bar zero or if you have zero bar one, uh, because you phased it onto the appropriate half of time. After the alternate allele, we have a number here. That's the quality. So just like we've, we've sort of given scores for bases and for alignments, we also have a quality score. Uh, associated with with uh, the variant, this is where it gets a little bit dicey. We, we've been talking about like 10 means 10% 10 error, 20 means 1%, and 30 means 0.1%. It's logarithmic. The same is supposed to be true here, but we get wildly high uh, quality scores and variant color. This is what I consider a problem in the field. I think people are working on it. But what you'll see is, in this case, you actually see a reasonable 29. But it's not unusual to see, uh, when we look at our variant scores later on, you'll see a variant score that's like 1,000 or 3,000. If you actually work out the, the arithmetic there, that's an extremely high confidence that you have a SNF there. And almost never are you that confident that, that you have a variant in every position. So that's something that they would need a recalibrator. Uh, the next series of fields are part of the info field. Um, oh, actually, pass, basically, if you write pass, 
Uh, it means that that variant passed all the filters. If you write anything else besides pass, uh, it basically defines why it failed the filter. Um, after that, you have an info field. And so here, basically, I'm describing what these mean. So ns equals three means we have three samples. CP is combined gaps across all three samples, so 14x in this case. So a little frequency was 4.5. These were some older info fields. So if some VCF files you'll see have DB listed if it's listed in DB Smith. H2 if it's a half max unit. And then the final part is this actually gives you the key to understanding what's going on here. So GT means the genotype. So that's the 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1. The next one is genotype quality, GQ. So here we see 48, 48, and 43. DP is the depth. So here we see 1, 8, and 5. And then the last one is HQ, which is the haplotype quality. Um, and we're going to list on that last one. So is it your genotype quality or high for one depth four? So individually, yes. If you have one X coverage, you're suddenly wondering, oh, can I even call this as a SNP at all? But if you have done combined variant calling, um, you might see evidence in the other samples that might lead you to believe that this, this might be a reasonable genotype. Same thing with, um, if you take it one step further, uh, there is something called haplotype aware variant collar, or, or like the GATK has something called the haplotype collar. And, and when you basically use that, you actually have the power to call variants in places where you have zero X coverage. Just because you've seen, you've seen that, you know, this one sample has variants that all the other ones did, but even in this one place that we had no coverage, we saw that all the other 50 samples or so also had this other SNP. So because they're in, in linkage disequilibrium, uh, you can assume that it also had a variant at that location. Here's another representation of of the VCF record. It basically just sort of distills what these info fields meant. So here are some more. Um, the ones that we use a lot, uh, QD is a very interesting one. It's basically the quality score divided by the depth. So it's basically a normalized quality score. And MQ is basically the root mean square of the mapping qualities. That's a useful filter. Also, the number of map quality zero reads at a given location, MQ zero. So I mentioned there was a best practices document for GATK. And one of the things that they talk about is which of these info fields would you actually use if you're trying to filter your variants. And so what I've shown here are all the different info fields that are used for for recalibration or filtering. And so QD is the one I just talked about, the grade score divided by the unfiltered depth. There's also a haplotype score. So if you have two segregating haplotypes, so it estimates the consistency. MQ ranks, so we just talked about read position ranks, that was interesting. Let's say you have a bunch of reads that only have a variant seemingly at the end of the read. We're not going to believe that, you know, if you assume like Illumina technology, we're less likely to believe that's a true variant than if we see that basically there are reads at all positions that contribute to that being known as a variant. So this read position rank sum basically gives a score um, that leads us to believe whether or not this can be a true variant, depending on where in the read does this occur. Uh, we also have a Fisher's exact test to detect strand bias. MQ we talked about. Inbreeding coefficient A is used, but only if you have 10 or more samples, so it's almost never used. Uh, and then DP is the, the total unfiltered depth over all samples. Yes? Can you compare to a specific What's that? 
unfiltered. So, so all the variant colors they have almost like pre-filters that that run. So some, for example, Illumina has a variant color called Starling, and Starling will pretty much ignore um, all all uh, reads that have a, a mapping quality lower than something. So any mapping quality lower than like twenty. Uh, might get ignored by some. So that's something that's already been filtered before very common. Um, so in this case, when we're listing db as total unfiltered depth, that's the depth before the very color tries to do any pre-filtering. And it's different for each of the very colors. GHK has different pressures as well. Um, so a little bit related to the green filtering. Is there a way to tell um, the very important software that the samples are related. I don't, I, I don't uh, think I've seen anything like that. There are, there are pedigree aware or trio aware variant colors where you, in a separate step, define the relationship between the individuals. Um, the logical place would be, remember how we defined these read groups and we said, oh, the sample name is something? It would be wonderful if you could, in that read group, define, okay, this sample has a father whose sample ID is that, this sample has a mother that has this following sample, or, or if you're doing any sort of other type of genetics, you could define other sorts of relationships. But I haven't seen anything like that, other than these very specific variant colors. Most of the time that actually happens as sort of a post-processing step when people evaluate their variants, they'll, they'll enforce that criteria. Other questions? So I've, I've shoved a bunch of info fields down your throats, but I was going to show the relevance of, of knowing about these now. So the, the first thing we talked about is you can use, it's almost like you looked ahead, you can use uh, familial relationships to, to verify how well your, your variants are doing. So basically, if you did SNP calling individually, so you did SNP calling on the mother, father, and child separately, if you found that a site was in conflict with each other, uh, you might be less likely to believe that, that uh, locus. Um, now, in the Thousand Genomes project, we did measure what the apparent normal mutation rate is in humans. And, and, and what's interesting about that is, in males, it's about seven times higher than in females. But, don't know why. Just an observation. Um, but so you can, you can use that kind of uh, constraints in your bank calling. Here's another project where where uh, we were talking about using haplotypes or imputation to strengthen everything. So in the Thousand Genomes project, they, they had three main sub-projects. But one of them had lots and lots of samples that were whole genome sequence, uh, but only had between four to six X of coverage. Um, and then they had this exome project where they had a lot higher coverage, probably in the range of 30 to 40 X, um, but because they're exome sequence, you couldn't necessarily use imputation on them. And what they found is, is the performance of this low coverage project. So here we have basically on the x-axis, uh, the number of genotype calls, and the y-axis is basically the number of incorrect variant genotype calls. And what they saw is, because we used imputation on the low coverage data set, we were able to get results that were very close to those on the Exxon project, even though they had vastly higher coverage. So basically going from about 5x to 30x. So six times more coverage, you were able to overcome that difference in coverage simply by observing you know, your, your patterns of, of uh, linkage to security. So that's another method that people take. They can use imputation. Uh, this slide just simply shows what is the power of using a single sample approach versus a multi-sample approach as far as the genotype accuracy goes. 
So you see you get a slight improvement here, um, just looking at the proportion of non-calls. But the best overall was if you use GATK with a program that's really good at doing imputation like Beagle, and then the genotype calling accuracy shot way up. A lot of people basically use uh, different data sets as proxies. So the HapMath project, basically they, they genotyped uh, a bunch of locations, about one SNP per, per 2KB, and, but it has lots of individuals and 11 different populations. And that's really useful if, if you have a human data set, you're trying to figure out if you have false negatives. You can see, look at your overlap with the HapMath variance and see, are you detecting the same variance in the same populations? The, the uh, converse of that is basically looking at dbSNP. So dbSNP has tons of variance. Basically, it's a database just packed with variance. Some of them are not even good variant calls. Um, but it's a good estimate. If you suddenly do your variant calling and you see that 20% of your data set does not exist in dbSNP, you might want to question, do I have a lot of false positives? Uh, because the belief is most of the variants that have already been seen in these different populations or different organisms are already cataloged in these things. So it's a good proxy for false positives. Another thing people do to screen these variants is by looking at coverage. So in this, in this case, basically, uh, Anne Alton and, and Hernandez at Cornell, they looked at what was the coverage uh, along this uh, this chromosome, and basically everything in red were, were half map sites. So basically they saw that the mean the mean coverage should be around here. So suddenly when they saw you know variants that had coverages way up here or way down here, those were most likely to be false positives. So basically they devised a filter that basically tried to define an upper and a lower bound for what the coverage would be uh, when accepting a variant call. One of the examples we saw this morning was, uh, remember we were using the indelible aligner, and we saw one of the signals for trying to evaluate if you wanted to realign a region was you saw a bunch of SNPs in one region. Well, that's also a really good filter for your variant calls. So if suddenly you see a lot of variant calls that are within like 15 bases of each other, that might be an indication that those are false positives. So this was just a study where we tried to look at which of our SNPs were in dbSNP, not in dbSNP, in a Sanger data set, and not in the Sanger data set. And basically you saw that basically anything close to 15 base pair in that study was most likely a false positive. There are other metrics people might just find out a good cutoff for the, the variant quality score. Uh, some people pay close attention to the transition transversion ratio. Um, so a lot of projects we saw basically try and monitor that the transition transversion ratio in, in humans, for example, is really close to two. Uh, if you have something divergent from that, it might be an indication that you have problems in your variant calling. But so I've given you a, some insight now. There's a lot of different filters you can use. And it's all daunting. It's, look, I see these puzzled looks on your faces like, oh my gosh, this is so much. And it is that daunting in real life too. So one of the answers of trying to cope with this is dynamic filtering. So for example, the road used to like looking at three things simultaneously. So as they would adjust their variant calling parameters, they would look at their DB SNP range. So what percentage of their variants were in DB SNP? They look at that transition transversion ratio, and then they would also look at what is the overlap with a SNP chip. So in this case, a, a thousand genomes uh, chip that they used. And from that, they were basically able to figure out, okay, at what point can we define our cutoffs? But to illustrate the problem, let's assume you have several pipelines. Today we use BWA and, and we're going to use GHK for our variant calling. And we'll apply some filters and then we'll annotate those variants. 
But you might also assume that somebody else might have a different pipeline that uses bow tie for the alignment and sound tools for variant calling. But those will need different filters because the variant callers behave differently, the aligners behave differently. But what if you wanted to use BWA with SAM tools, or Bowtie with DATK, or let's say you have different types of data sets. You can have low, nominal, or high coverage data sets. But even amongst those, you might have good runs, you might have some bad runs. Um, and then it gets really confusing when you start adding even more aligners and variant colors to the mix. And so you get this rage, you know, people start hiding their laptops and start yelling at their laptops. And so the, the solution to that is to, instead of using hard filters, one of the programs that's out there is also by GATK uh, called the Variant Quality Score with Calibrator. It's a bit of a misnomer. Basically what it tries to do is it tries to evaluate your data set compared to other data sets. So it compares it to HAFNA or DBSNF and tries to adjust the filters in just the right way so that you get the, the results that you're looking for. That only work with humans? No, well, assuming that you had truth data from elsewhere. So, what, so for example, in VQSR, um, right now it uses half math data and uh, this aluminum omni chip data as the truth data. If you were working on a different organism or even strain, um, you know, any sort of strain genetics, uh, as long as you had some sort of truth data that you could use as a reference point, you know, known variants, etc. Um, you can use that with VQSR. So the idea is you would partition, this is how VQSR does it. Luckily, you don't have to do this on your own. You would partition the data into sites that overlap half map 3.3 and Omnichip. And so basically, here it's basically on the x-axis, it's this uh, QD score, variant quality divided by depth. And then on the y-axis, you have evidence of strand bias. So everything in blue here is basically overlapping with truth data. Everything in, in red outside of that is basically something that might be suspicious. It might be a false positive. And so they use an expectation maximization algorithm here to basically learn what the most probable areas are for the truth data. And then they assign a probability to each variant based on how well it clusters to, to that training set. And then what they do is they throw out the 3% worst variants um, from that data and they train it some more. And in the end, you basically end up with a set of variants that definitely lie outside of here. So instead of filtering everything that you saw here that was red. Basically, what it ended up teaching itself is that only these, these uh, pink purplish variants up here are the ones that are the most likely to be erroneous. Um, and so it does this automatically for you, does several iterations of this expectation maximization algorithm, and it comes up with those filters that you can then apply to your BCF files. So how long is this taken when it's looking at that map data? Is it looking at it online? No, no, you, you actually have a, a flat file on your hard drive um, that, that has all that. The only, the only caveat that I would say about BQSR is that you need enough overlapping points. So the sad thing about today's exercise, because we had time constraints about how long we could spend aligning all our reads, et cetera, because of that, we simply, the little interval of reads that we've aligned to chromosome one isn't enough to actually utilize BQSR. So in today's exercise, we're going to use the manual filters. But moving forward, if you have a whole genome sequencing uh, data set, or even it's kind of a, a border case if you have exome data, but definitely with whole genome sequencing, you can use VQSR, and it does a really good job. So another, another description of, of how VQSR might do things, if you were just to look at you know, this QD filter, what, it, what it's doing internally is basically looking at, okay, 
what percentage of, of the variants overlap with DD SNP, for example, and which ones are basically novel you've never seen before. And so then you can basically place a threshold at some point. You can also look at it this way, basically look at it across uh, positionally. So you can see, okay, across the chromosome, you know, which, which variants are novel, which ones overlap. So in this case, what we see here is we see a bunch of red close to the center here. And so you might be more likely to, to filter the variants that occur close to the center here because those are the novel ones. It's a bit of a two-edged sword because if you're really trying to find new variants, those are also the ones that are less likely to, to be found in these databases. Yet, a lot of these filtering mechanisms rely on the fact that we probably all know what the system is. So you have to kind of be careful of that depending on what your project is. But for most projects, VQSR and this kind of filtering works really well. So to summarize, pre-processing is key. Basically everything that we did in, in module two, so we did the duplicate marking, the Intel realignment, these, and the base quality recalibration, all three of those actually contribute to reducing your false positives. Just like before, we have a standardized file format called BCF. It's a bit complicated, but after a while, after you've seen it a few times, it starts to make sense. And for improving results, uh, we've learned a little bit about using manual filtering techniques and dynamic filtering. Any questions before we begin the... Uh, the if we're using two different folders in the same sample set, what are the Ooh, we we often saw huge differences in size and units. Oh, sorry. So the question was, if you have one one series of experiment, like a series of experiments where you have used different variant colors, so let's say two different variant colors, what kind of overlap could you expect between the variants that are called? Um, that can often be a problem. I, I, a gut instinct would be, I'd say, 70 to 80 percent overlap, but I've seen less than that. In fact, if you read the 1,000 notes pilot paper really carefully to address that issue, they adopted a really weird voting mechanism. So, so it ended up being like if two sequencing centers out of three sequencing centers actually call that variant, then it would actually make it into the official thousand genomes list of variants, uh, just because that overlap was such a, a huge issue. So 70 to 80 percent is good. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that that might be good. I mean, you would you would want it to be much higher overlap. Yeah. Certainly, after filtering, that should be a lot higher. But before before filtering, if you're just looking at the raw BCF files. I think it might only be 70 to 80 percent. On that note, what about using two different variant colors for filtering? If they both agree on the variant, how do I say Yeah, no, that certainly works, assuming that the variant colors perhaps use very different algorithms. Uh, we also saw that issue in a thousand genomes project where we were looking at um, how Samuels was calling variants versus there was another variant color called GLF multiples um, uh, from, from the University of Michigan, I think, right? And, and basically, they both use almost the same exact equations for variant calling. And so they said, oh, look, we have, we have you know, almost the same results. They must be good. And as soon as you compared it to another variant color that didn't use the same exact equations, then, then you did see the differences. So, you have to be careful about that, but it is a good approach. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan about using orthogonal approaches, um, and that's for everything. So you might you might even say, you know, right now you might have an assay that used all luminous technology for it would be useful to like combine that with PacBio data or 454 data because they have different error modes. And so sometimes you can see, oh, these are most likely errors because I didn't see this in this other technology. Other questions? All right. Uh, so let's go.